Chapter 9, Saturday, February 2nd, 1980. The massacre of the men in cell block 4 went on until mid-morning. All over the penitentiary, the screams of the tortured victims could be heard, interspersed with radio transmissions announcing things like, we just killed five more down there. Only the strongest stomachs were able to stand the smell of burning flesh that permeated the air, especially in the units on the north side where I was. I saw a lot of men bend over and puke their guts out. It wasn't only the burning flesh, it was the whole scene that was becoming repulsive and the sickening fatty stench punctuated it. It wasn't until 10.30 or 11, three and a half to four hours after the death squad had entered the protection unit that the screaming stopped, though the smell of burning flesh never left the atmosphere. I was about to go down to the hospital to find some aspirin when an old friend of mine walked into the old men's dormitory and asked if we had any coffee. I gave him some and he and I sat down and started rapping. It looked like he'd just come out of the Vietnam War raid. His face smeared with black soot and blood. His hair was a matted mess. His prison fatigues covered with splotches of dried brown blood. Then I spotted a screwdriver sticking out of his back pocket. Hey, that screwdriver in your pocket there, I said. It looked like it's got some blood on it. Yeah. Got me a few down in dorm four, he bragged. Well, what happened? Run it down. As he did, describing in full detail the killings he'd seen his buddies participate in, plus his own deeds. He stabbed three men in the chest with his screwdriver, bashed in another's head, and burned a guy alive by throwing gasoline into his jam cell. While he was talking, I started thinking, I come a long way in 14 years. Even six years ago, I might have given some thought to paying back a snitch or welcher. Ten years ago, I gave it more than a thought. I actually shafted a dude who run off with our dope money. Fortunately, though, I didn't think at the time he didn't die. As I listened to this man go on about the murders he'd seen and committed in cell block four, I knew that even then I wouldn't have participated in what he was describing. A sickness had taken those men over, and I thank God I hadn't been infected by it, this time or any time. Still, I had to keep up my hardcore front with my old friend here. I'd known him a long time in the joint, but if he'd gone as overboard as he was saying, who knew if he'd snap on me? I couldn't tell if he was slurring his words because of drugs or fatigue, but in either case, he'd be hypersensitive, especially after using me as a confessional. Man, I would have been down there with you, I tried to explain, but I got my parole coming up in two months. I can dig it, bro. Just keep your eyes open. Anyone thinks you've been sitting on your ass up here and hiding out is liable to kill you if they catch you by yourself. We finished what we set out to do in four, but there's a lot of other guys out there in population getting knocked off right now. Just make sure you covered your back if you do step out into it. I finished my coffee, thanked him for the advice, and got away from him as fast as I could. <laughs> I gathered several friends from the dorm, and together, with extreme caution, we embarked into the madness. First, we hit the hospital. Not for anything more exotic than aspirin. I've been eating for two hours. Then we made our way down to the kitchen to try to get some food. My headache was not only from revulsion, but from hunger. We hadn't eaten anything since six o'clock the night before. Getting through to the kitchen was no easy task. The corridor was filled with doped rioters shouting and hollering at each other, stampeding back and forth in the smoky haze. We found very little food. The kitchen had been totally trashed and raided. Some cans of tomatoes had been left and we were happy to have them. Though, they were one of our least favorite foods when the prison served them. On our way back, we stopped to take a look at cell block four. I had a friend there and wanted to find out what had happened to him. I didn't locate him. I got lost in the bodies and blood strewn all over the place. Corpses hanging from the railing, sticking out between the bars of a cell. I saw one man 
hanging on a door with a rod through his skull, another with his genitals lying next to him. These sights and the odor of shit and burned flesh that filled my nostrils made me want to run out the other way, but I forced myself to go through the tear and see for myself the devastation. There is no way I can transmit the full horror of that scene, and there's no way I can erase it from my mind. My only point in recounting in detail the savagery of this riot and putting violent imagery in other, other minds is to etch the picture of prison life as it really is into the public opinion. Etch it so indelibly that people can never erase it from their consciousness and the consequences of inhumane treatment. Think of it. Though my screwdriver wielding executioner friend is a lifer, he's eligible for parole after he served 10 or 15 years of his sentence. He'll be out on the streets again. After all, he's learned about being the most violent dude on the block in the pen. After murdering four men in this riot, sitting next to you on a bus maybe. What your tax money taught him during his 10 years in prison in terms of dealing with life. What has your tax money taught him? It's taught him to hate, to steal, to fight, to kill. If you look at him the wrong way and he's feeling depressed or if he's broke and you look flush, he's more than likely to use one or all of his talents on you. Your tax dollar also teaches inmates to rape their own sex and take their most sublime ecstasy in an act of violent sodomy. James Foley was a 19 year old peach fuzz kid from Albuquerque who came into the penitentiary in December 1979 to do a life sentence for first degree murder of a manager of a Circle K store he robbed. Both was big, six foot four, 200 pounds, and like most kids, when they first entered the joint, he tried to cover his youth and fear by acting tough. For James Foley, it didn't work. The first week he was in prison, he was beaten up by a group from the Chicano clique. The administration locked him up in protection for four weeks, then made the mistake of putting him back in population a week or so before the riot. It didn't matter why he got the protection. The very fact that he'd wound up there made him a punk in the convict's eyes. In the midst of the riot on Saturday afternoon, that same group of Chicanos found him again, sitting on his bunk in dormitory A1, trying to stay out of everyone's way. As he saw the eight rioters approach his bed, wielding pipes and bats, he became terrified and started crying and begging them not to bother him. They answered by telling him to take off his clothes. Take off your panties, boy. <laughs> I'm bullshitting, man. He doesn't say that. He did, mistakenly thinking obedience would save him. When he was naked, they told him to lie down on his side and clasp his hands under his knees. They tied his wrists together, binding him in this fetal position, then turned him over onto his stomach. And each of these eight barbiturated men took their turn sodomizing James Foley, while the others whacked him severely with pipes and bats. When they'd all had their sexual satisfaction, they pushed him off the bed and continued the beating, kicking him in the head and kidneys until he was unconscious. Later, it would be discovered that he was more than unconscious. They had kicked James Foley to death. This one small band of rapists, their number now increased by other rioters who joined in the beating of James Foley, turned their attention to other residents of the dormitory. They had watched Foley's rape in fear for their own safety. A1 was a unit where the younger inmates in the prison were housed. They had thought that by staying out of the way, they would be safe and had not armed themselves. Each of these young convicts was tied in the same fetal position as Foley. Each had a pillowcase placed over his head and each was sodomized more than 10 times. God damn. Whenever they made a move or a sound, a pipe or a fist would hit them over the head. They were dimly aware of the sounds of moaning going on around them, but not until their rapists had gone to a greener pasture and the first of them untied and unhooded himself, was it clear to them that their dormitory had been turned into a battlefield brothel that would have shocked the father of sadism himself. After the riot was over, one of these rape victims talked to a reporter. He was telling his story. He said, 
because he wanted to let America know that inmates get raped by other inmates all the time in every prison in the country. He wanted to tell it so the public would be enlightened. While the rapists stopped the prison for more perverse ecstasy, other rioters wandered through the hallways and dormitories looking for vengeance on old enemies. In prison, it takes only small incidents to make a man form a vendetta against a fellow convict. And under the influence of drugs and freed anger, these grudges seem worth killing for. Not all the payback this out was fatal. And relatively few took part in these random revenge murders. In all, only 25, including the dozen or so cell block four executioners participated in the killings, but they ended more than 30 lives. In the light of the sober days to come, these payback attacks seem senseless, even to many of the perpetrators. One inmate was killed because he'd gone out with the murderer's girlfriend 10 years before. Another had his eyes gouged out, yet another had one testicle cut off. Both lived to remember the moment and carry the scars. An inmate carefully winding down the main corridor to the safety of dormitory E2, the only unit in the entire building that was left intact where men who wanted to mind their own business could just sit around, drink coffee, and play cards, bumped into someone accidentally because the smoke was so thick he couldn't see. The next thing he knew was the heavy, cold feel of steel rods pounding on his head. Fortunately, he saw a meat cleaver coming at him in time to ward it off with his arm. The cleaver caught him on the wrist and cut clear through to the bone. The gashes on his head and arm bled profusely and the many towels a self-styled inmate paramedic kept wrapped around them until medical attention was available hours later. It got so frenetic that these wandering gangs became even less particular about who they attacked. If a man was walking alone, the gangs in their convoluted thinking would consider his vulnerability a worthy reason to beat him and teach him a lesson about the folly of weakness. Lust for Sniff was also a reason to kill. Two men had just gotten a jar of shoe glue from the shoe shop in the basement and were walking upstairs when a group of five Chicanos standing at the top of the stairs saw them and demanded that they turn over the pr precious solvent to them. The two refused and the larger group beat it in their lives away from them. <laughs> them motherfuckers wanted to sniff some glue, boy. There was some instant karma too. One of the rape squad got his throat cut a few hours after he'd satiated himself in dormitory A1. He lived but spent a lot of hours bleeding and wondering if he would. The majority of rioters who were not involved in these surges of rage upon their fellow convicts turned their energy to tearing apart the prison itself, setting fires everywhere, breaking everything they could get their hands on. Some found safe havens like dormitory E2, while others merely took their chances staggering around the hallways in a blind euphoria that hopefully made tolerable the beatings they inevitably suffered. The smarter inmates looked for a way out of the institution. They knew they were taking a chance going outside. No officials had said, if you wanna come out, do it, we won't shoot. They had no idea what was waiting for them out there, but they knew it couldn't be any worse than the chaos closing in on them on the inside. About 20 men who'd escaped from cell block four had the wits to grab one of the acetane torches on their way out and head straight for the empty cell block across the hall. They used the torch to cut a hole in the metal door on the east end of the unit and made a hasty retreat surrendering at the front gate in the yard. When the rioters realized that inmates were getting out, they stationed a group to guard the opening and prevent anyone else from leaving. They got there in time to stop the black Muslim leader and 30 of his men from going through. The Muslims weren't going to be stopped, however. They found out about the escape of E1 residents earlier and headed over to the South Dormitory. There too, rioters stood guard. But this time, the Muslim leader was determined. Move aside, he demanded. We're moving out. The hell you are, the rider answered, his back poised to swing. 
The Muslim leader was fast and knocked the rider to the ground with the billy club he was carrying. A few of his group took care of the rest of the guarding inmates and the opening was cleared. The blacks went through the hole one by one with the leader out first announcing to the officials that he and his group were surrendering. Nothing was going unavenged this day though. The rioters managed to stab the last two blacks to climb out, wounding them but not stopping their escape. At 1.30 in the afternoon, 20 inmates after the Muslims surrendered. Another 20 inmates found their way out. Throughout the rest of the day, men were breaking out of the penitentiary in groups and alone, through any opening they could find, often fighting the rioters who blocked their way. Many of those escaping were injured, cut and beaten either by the inside rampage or while trying to leave. Timing was with the wounded who had escaped. Two National Guard medical support teams, the 744 Medical Detachment and the 717 Medevac Helicopter Unit had arrived at the front gate just before 1 p.m. The helicopters quickly transported the more seriously injured to St. Vincent Hospital in nearby Santa Fe, then transferred the more stabilized patients to Albuquerque Medical Facilities. As more inmates surrendered, the tents set up by the medical support teams filled with cases of bone fractures, amputations, and deep shock. Soon drug overdoses became the number one malady that these teams were treating. Inmates coming out of the prison would carry wounded and OD'd and unconscious riders out into the yard up to the front gate where the medics stationed behind the fence could get them once the gate was open. Some of the convicts doing the carrying did so just as an excuse to get out, but a few stayed with the rioters, functioning as paramedics inside the prison, treating the wounded, hostages included, and repeatedly manning stretchers to get the seriously hurt to safety and medical care. The gatehouse at Tower One in front of the penitentiary had become not only the administration command post, but a makeshift interrogation center where unwounded inmates and later release hostages who were physically able were debriefed. The surrendering convicts were told to walk up to the front gate 10 at a time with their hands on top of their heads. The gate would be open. They'd be let into the 10 foot moat of land between the two perimeter fences and told to line up with their hands on the fence. Corrections officers and any other officials handy in the confusion frisked them. Razor blades, homemade shanks, scissors, and pockets full of pills were found. All weapons were tagged and placed in a large box, a box that reporters and officials wandering into the gatehouse would sift through curiously throughout the riot and for days afterwards. When this frisking was over, the prisoners would be handcuffed with plastic wire and taken into the gatehouse for questioning. Anyone whose weapon showed telltale traces of blood was handed over to the police for special interrogation elsewhere. After the debriefing, some of the men were sent to the warm walls of the annex, where women inmates were usually housed. But the unit filled quickly, and soon there was nowhere else for them but the 10-foot moat of fenced-in, but not sheltered land that surrounded the smoldering penitentiary. Those early debriefings didn't net officials much information about the hostages, but they did give them first verification that killing was taking place inside. Dr. Mark Orner was one of the group conducting the debriefing. Despised as he was, he got enough information from the 20 men who'd broken out of cell block four to be able to identify 15 to 20 inmates as those doing the murdering and to compile a list of 10 death squad members. There were hostages being released, but they were not in a condition to be questioned. The first was Officer Elton Bigfoot Curry. As the cell block four snitch slaughter was beginning at sunrise, Curry's beaten, stabbed, naked body was taken to the main entrance on a mattress. The rioters had doubts that he'd live and they didn't want him dying in their hands. They knew their ex-warden, Felix Rodriguez, would be true to his word and storm the building if one of his guards died. Thanks to radio conversations with Captain Royball and other officers being kept in the North Wing, Prison officials outside were assured that at least some of the remaining 10 hostages were alive. The rioters had allowed Deputy Warden Montoya to speak with the guards to put power behind their demand that the penitentiary not be rushed. 
At this moment, our lives are in your hands, Officer Larry Mendoza told Montoya. What else can I say? Montoya spent considerable time throughout the morning promising them that their safety was his main concern, that officials would take no actions that would jeopardize it. At 8.20 a.m., Officer Mike Hernandez was carried out and handed over to medics after an hour of haggling between the two sides of negotiators. All morning, there were radio reports and snatches of conversations from inside the prison to the effect that Lieutenant Jose Anaya was in need of medical attention. An inmate called Doc, who was working as a paramedic, was overheard talking to another inmate on the radio. I'm over here checking this Lieutenant Anaya, he said. I think Anaya's got a concussion, and I think he's got a busted rib, and I know that he's got a heart condition and needs to be moved. He needs to be taken out of here. The rioters grabbed this opportunity to make a trade and offered Anaya in return for Deputy Ward Montoya himself, or at least a medical doctor. The Deputy Warden refused the deal but offered them the carrot they most wanted, a meeting with the news media in return for Anaya. No agreement was struck, however. Lieutenant Anaya was left to the ministering of the inmate paramedic. Because so many people were using the radios and confusing the transmissions, riot negotiators requested and got a field telephone for one-to-one -one communication outside with officials. The first person they let call was the governor. They told him that the riot was started just to get somebody's attention and complain that they were being treated like a bunch of kids and asked for the opportunity to discuss their grievances with him, Deputy Warden Montoya, Deputy Corrections Secretary Felix Rodriguez, and the media. Governor King promised to set up a table for such a conference in the prison yard in one hour. The rioters in turn assured him no one was going to be hurt and they would give up the hostages by three or four o'clock that afternoon. The governor reiterated that the prison would not be stormed. However, one riot negotiator didn't like the inclusion of Montoya in the conference and called him to tell him so. I talked to Bruce King a while ago and he said he was going to come down here and I would appreciate it if you didn't come down here with him. Hearing this, other rioters with radios chimed in with their feelings about Montoya. You've got fucking uncles, you've got brothers, and you've got cousins all working here, and that is bad. Through it all, Montoya stayed calm, responding only in the soothing manner he'd learned so recently at hostage school. Finally, negotiations began in earnest. Inmate runners brought out their first list of demands and gave it to Felix Rodriguez at the front gate. The cement walkway from the prison building to the tower gate became the bargaining lane. Riot negotiators were guaranteed safety to talk face to face with officials, but through the crosswires of the perimeter fence that separated them. The first list contained six demands. One, reduce overcrowding. Two, comply with all court orders. Three, no charges to be filed against inmates. Four, due process and classification procedures. Five, 10 gas masks. Six, two new walkie talkies. They were given the 10 gas masks and promises to consider the rest. Riot negotiators also requested that a doctor be sent inside the building to care for the mounting number of injured. Even Captain Royball joined in on this request, but Montoya insisted the wounded be brought outside for treatment. He did allow firefighters to go into the yard to put out the fire spreading through the administration area. But when they approached the windows, they were driven away by rioters stabbing at the hoses with pipes and sharpened broom handles, even throwing gasoline. While the institution burned, riot negotiators were writing up a fuller list of demands. They handed them to Rodriguez that afternoon. This time, officials gathered at the warden's residence to discuss strategy and determine what became these responses to that list. Number one, bring federal officials to the penitentiary to assure inmates no retaliation will occur. Answer, we will ask for the assistance of the FBI. Two, reclassify the men held in cell block three. Answer, security risk will remain in cell block three. Three, leave all inmates in the units they were originally assigned to until uprising is over. 
Answer, we cannot agree to this until the prison condition is determined. Four, end overcrowding at the prison. Answer, about 288 beds will be ready in July and we have asked for an additional 200 from the legislature. Five, improve visiting conditions at the prison. Answer, this has been in effect for two weeks as worked out with the American Civil Liberties Union Negotiating Committee. Six, improve prison food. Answer, we will hire a nutritionist to oversee the food operation. Seven, allow the news media into the prison. Answer, not until all the hostages are released. Eight, improve recreational facilities. Answer, we are now negotiating with the American Civil Liberties Union. Nine, improve the prison's educational facilities. Answer, this is being discussed with the legislature along with raising inmate wages from the present 25 cents per hour. 10, appoint a different disciplinary committee. Answer, we will take a long, hard look at that. <laughs> 11, end overall harassment. Answer, we will have additional correctional officers who will be trained. The Corrections Commission is also looking at this problem. After receiving this, riot negotiators did not give up the hostages at three or four o'clock as they promised. The corrections panel had both missed the point and skirted the issue in most of their responses. In asking for the media to have access to the prison, inmates weren't referring only to the immediate situation, but to the long run as well. They wanted the media to have general access to the penitentiary in the future so that the public was constantly informed about conditions there. As it was, all media representatives were persona non gratis at Santa Fe. And as for improvement in visiting conditions and recreational facilities being negotiated with the American Civil Liberties Union, Inmates knew very well from recent experience that such negotiations were time consuming and even when worked out, implementation was thoroughly resisted by prison authorities. Though the rioters who were doing most of the negotiation knew it was imperative to end the insanity going on around them, they also felt they could not give up with so little to show for the hell they'd been through and the riot raged on. The state capitol in Santa Fe, where the legislature was in the midst of its 30-day session, Governor Bruce King asked 10 key legislators to interrupt their legislative committee meetings and join him in his office. He needed their guidance on the decision he just made.